This episode is sponsored by Navni, the top-ranked anonymous writing website in the world, providing free wellness resources and low-cost online therapy to help people cope with emotional distress. Write anonymously. Feel better at novni.com. Welcome, everyone, to Beyond Surviving, the safe space for survivors of childhood sexual abuse to receive support, resources, and share their stories. Beyond Surviving is about freedom, healing, connection, and even laughter and fun. Most importantly, it's about letting go of the pain of abuse and finally moving on. I'm Rachel Grant, and for those of you who don't yet know me, I've been a sexual abuse recovery coach since 2007, and I'm the author of Beyond Surviving, the final stage of recovery from sexual abuse. I work with survivors who are sick and tired of feeling broken and unfixable, and I help them reclaim their lives and heal and finally feel normal. You can learn more about me and the Beyond Surviving program at www.rachelgrantcoaching.com. Now, as always, I am always excited to have my guest here, but today I'm particularly thrilled to be connecting with Lakeisha Woodard. She's going to be talking with us about her personal journey after healing from sexual abuse and how she was able to turn her pain into purpose. So you know we here at Beyond Surviving are all about that, that we're not meant to be, you know, stuck in a life sentence of pain, that there is life after abuse and that we can step into our purpose and our power and choice and claim authority over our lives and authorship. So Lakeisha is going to be talking with us about that and so much more. And just to tell you a little bit about her, she has a a huge passion for empowering women and holds an MBA in global management. So for over 10 years, she's motivated and captivated women on personal development. And her passion really blossomed during her matriculation at Clark Atlanta University when she joined the group Youthful Survivors. So this is an amazing thing that they're doing. They travel across the country and they share their stories of surviving sexual abuse. And as she, you know, moved forward in her journey and during her career, she unmasked this ugly truth to most of the problems among women which is a lack of self-awareness. And in order to solve this issue, I love that. She saw a problem. She saw a place where things were not going right. She said, well, what am I going to do about that? So her answer was a sister's truth. And this is a sister coaching business that helps women to discover, define, and live their truth for manifesting a courageous life without limits. As a sister coach, she provides women with the necessary tools and encouragement to stay true to themselves for a purpose-driven life. Doesn't that sound great, (laughs) y'all? I love that. And not just that, she's also a motivational speaker. She teaches women the importance of accepting their flaws. Yummy, I love that too, for, for personal growth and happiness. So as you can see, we've got a real powerhouse with us here today and we're so wonderfully blessed to have her with us. Lakeisha, welcome. Hi, Rachel. How are you? Thank you I'm so well. much. <laughs> you, I forgot who you were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> well, that girl sounds amazing. I'm going to meet her. Honey, that's you. <laughs> Thank you so much. You know, it's, it's so funny how you just kind of, when you're so wrapped in your, your purpose and your calling, you forget <laughs> all about yeah. You know what it is. What it is that you're doing. So yeah, That's thank you for that intro. True. I hear that. Yeah, of course. My pleasure. So I'm so so fascinated with um, this process that you have developed, sister coaching. I'd love to start there, so we have context and and really more understanding of what you are up to um, these days. So can you tell us a little bit more about um, sister coaching and what that is and entails? Sure, absolutely. Where, well, Sister Coach is my way of giving a name to life coach. Hmm. <laughs> and what sets me apart from other life coaches is that I walk alongside you on your journey, sharing my personal 
life experiences as extra encouragement. So like a sister, we are linked by our karma life experiences and struggles, right? Yeah. So it's my personal life experiences that I use to help to educate as well as motivate my clients so they can live in their truth. And I do this because I wholeheartedly believe that there is power, oh, my God, there's power in our testimony, mm-hmm. the power to uplift another woman so she can lean harder on her faith for reaching her breakthrough. So with all that being said, I pretty much give my clients what you get from a sister, the hard truth that we don't want to hear or face. Mm. <laughs> but what I've learned over the years is that it's not so much what you say, but how you say it. So I give the hard truth to my clients, wrap the motivation, and tie it with the inspirational bow. Wonderful. Yeah, I love that. It's a real opportunity to connect with someone in a journey, right? So Absolutely. When I, yeah, I love that. And, you know, back when back in my day when I was going through my master's in counseling psychology and I was really in this inquiry of do I go into therapy, do, be, do I become a licensed therapist, or am I going to go the coaching route? One of the biggest reasons why I chose coaching was for exactly what you said there, when we mm-hmm. can share our personal story, right, it mm-hmm. can become an inspiration. It can become a point of connection and bonding and understanding. And I just knew that that was so important for me in doing the work that I was going to do with survivors of sexual abuse and that that, you know, licensed therapy was going to really clamp that down in ways that I didn't want. Um, Mm -hmm. So I'm right there with you in the power of story. And speaking of that, you know, one of the, the, the big turn points in your life, it sounds like, was when you became involved with youthful survivors and you began touring around and sharing your story about, you know, sexual abuse. I'd love to hear more about mm-hmm. that, like what your inspiration was and what it was like to, to be involved in that process. Yeah, absolutely. Um, like you mentioned earlier, I was attending Clarkland University, and that's when I answered the ad. It was, it was an ad in the in the college newspaper, you know, for um, Youth for Survivors. So Youth for Survivors was a nonprofit group consisting of all different type of, you know, college students, and we went around to different schools, churches, and organizations just speaking about all the different adversities that we overcame. There was someone talking about, you know, being HIV positive. There was someone mm-hmm. talking about homelessness. There was somebody talking about, you know, being incarcerated. And then you had me. <laughs> mm-hmm. I answered the ad to speak about sexual abuse. Now, at the time, I had not started any therapy sessions at all for my, wow. you know, to start my healing. So I just jumped right into being a speaker. It, yeah, about, you know, talking about my personal experience of sexual abuse. And I'll never forget my very first speaking engagement because I talked and talked and talked and talked and talked. <laughs> <completely>. <laughs> Rachel, I completely went over my time and the next speaker's time. Oh, goodness. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just, you know, telling my story because, you know, it was the first time that I really had the opportunity to just really just get it all out, if you will. Right. And at the end of all our presentations, oh, my God, I never forget. I remember like it was yesterday. A young girl came up to me and told me that she made me pregnant by her mother's boyfriend. Wow. That completely changed my life because at that moment, I realized that my suffering wasn't for nothing. And that I can actually inspire other children to come forward in order to end the abuse. Now, in this little girl's situation, she wasn't pregnant, thank God, but there was definitely evidence of sexual abuse, and they ended up removing her from the home. Yeah. So, yeah. That's amazing. That was my experience, yeah. Yeah. And it was after I joined Youth for Survivors, that's actually how I started my therapy sessions as well. Yeah, it sounds like it. Like that just kind of broke it, broke things open for you and created that mm-hmm. space that we need as survivors. You know, that moment of acknowledgement, right? And um, I think we all have that moment in our journey, some on a stage, <laughs> um, <laughs> most often with a friend or, or a trusted family member or someone. I love that. That's, again, I told you all, powerhouse. She's like, I'm just going to walk up on this stage. Haven't ever talked about this ever. Yeah, that's bold. And I love that boldness because, yeah, it's so true. When we share our story, the opportunity to impact the lives of other people, to embolden them and Mm -hmm. to support them absolutely um, comes from that. 
Yeah, and so this sounds like, you know, it, it launched you into that time where you were doing your healing work and mm -hmm. um, going through that process. What do you think are, are some of the key things that really shifted for you when it came to getting clear and building that confidence to then go on to, you know, start your business? And tell us a little bit about that journey, because I know for so many of my clients and um, the, you know, survivors who I talk to, there's this real feeling of almost missing out, right? Like, oh, my life is so, you know, stuck in the past and I'm constantly trying to just get through the day. I feel like I can't even step in to my purpose. I can't identify mm -hmm. it. I can't, you know, get there. So I'd love to hear what that was like for you to, you know, what was the process for you getting that clarity, first of all, and then building the confidence to go after it? Yeah, absolutely. So my healing journey started with therapy uh, because, like I said, my very first time speaking about it, you know, I talked for so long that I didn't just talk about the sexual abuse. I talked about everything. Sure. You know, growing up in the in the projects, you know, right outside of Chicago, um, that as for Ian, the coordinator of Youth for Survivors, she was like, okay, we need to get you some help. Mm -hmm. So my healing process started with therapy. That's how I was introduced to therapy. And, you know, I had many issues, as you can imagine, to overcome as a result of sexual abuse. But after healing, I found myself at a crossroads because a new journey was starting. And that journey consisted of three phases that I've been able to identify and put a name to years later. And those three phases are discovering, defining, and living your truth. And I, I gained clarity during the discover and defining, you know, true phases that I went through. And so now I'm consistently building confidence and courage daily as I journey through the live your truth phase. So, mm -hmm. you know, let me give them, you know, take a moment to fully explain, explain those three phases. Please, yeah. So discover your truth means to become aware of the person God created you to be. This is not the person your parents, friends, or society says that you should be. And then the final truth means to identify on the calling and purpose that God has put on your life. And I purposely left out spouses and children because our calling is bigger than just them. <laughs> sure, <laughs> yeah. You know, we got parents that say, you know, my husband, my kids is my life. Well, your life means a little bit more than that, than mm -hmm. just that. Yeah. And then living your truth means to have the courage to embrace all aspects who we are, and then present that person to the world. Hmm. So during the Discover Your Truth phase, I had to personally really dig deep and pull back the many different layers, right, to get to the root of who I am, the person God created me to be. And because I did this because I never only wanted to be known as a sexual abuse survivor because yeah. I knew deep down there was way more to me to me than just that. So I had to get to know the heal, the confident, the courageous Keisha in order to get to the root of who I truly am. And then there was the the final truth phase. And in this phase, I, I was searching for the true meaning of my life, right? Why did I go through everything that I went through, you know, for 18 years? I mm. wanted to know and figure out the purpose and the calling that was placed on my life. So then there's the last phase. And in this phase, but as I'm currently in now, once I discover who I truly was and the calling on my life, it was time to live it out. Now, that seems super simple when you say it, but it's not so easy to present your authentic self to the world because that's when you're, you know, when you're opening up the door for judgment sure. and ridicule. Yeah. And that's a door that no one wants to open up. Not yeah. Now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so true. I think um I I certainly have had these periods in my life and I, I see my clients struggle with this too where you know we sometimes can swoop through those first two stages. Yep, I'm clear. Yep, I'm there. Yep, yep. But oh man, when it comes to kind of oh, okay, now I'm actually going to like put this on paper somewhere or I'm going to start, you know, you know, actually say it out loud to other people or step into it. Yeah, yeah all sorts of like resistance and fears and challenges mm -hmm. just go up. Yeah. So let's break this down a little bit. I love, um, thank you for sharing kind of how you personally connected with each of those, you know, stages mm -hmm. that you've, you've defined. Let's talk a little bit about what our listeners can look at or focus on. 
So like maybe one tip or one little piece of advice that, okay, if you know, the discovery phase, what are, what are some of the key things that they could be doing or um, take on that's going to really help them, you know, in that first step? Sure, sure. Well, a tip for, uh, if you don't mind, I give tips for all three phases. Yeah. So, okay, so a tip for um, journeying, journeying through discovery of truth phase, which is a phase for gaining clarity, is to simply just stop being afraid to let someone else down. Mm. And I know that may sound really, really harsh, but I'm all about self-care, self-love, and self-awareness. Because it's the success of the goals that we set in our lives start and end with self. Some people find themselves working hard to make someone else proud. I'm raising my hand right now. You can't see me, uh-huh. but I'm raising my hand because I wouldn't do that. Sure. <laughs> you know, we find ourselves working so hard to make someone else proud instead of doing what's best for us. You know, mm-hmm. so I'm spe- like I said, I'm speaking from personal experience because I had to take that exact same advice to feel confident right. about my decision, you know, when I decided not to go back to law school because, I, you know, I attended law school for a little while. So, yeah. You okay. Also clar- oh, please, go, oh, ahead. go ahead. So you also get clarity during the define your truth phase. And the tip I want to give is to really just open your eyes and pay attention because what people are coming to you for, you know, uh, constantly, you know, we tend to overlook those natural talents and gifts, right, mm-hmm. as being tied to our purpose because, you know, it's so easy for us to do and provide us with all this joy, you know, these tremendous amounts of happiness, which is what our purpose is supposed to do. Like I literally had a client tell me that, that, you know, catering couldn't be her purpose because she loved it so much. Right. Oh goodness! Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we, you know, so we cannot overlook, you know, the simple things that come easy to us, and that's exactly what I had to do, you know, under in order to understand my purpose. And yeah. then, when you're in the living your truth phase, which is the phase where you build the confidence that you need, the courage, the perseverance, well, this is also the most challenging phase out of the three phases. And the reason is because when you present yourself to the world, the true self to the world, you know, you're making yourself susceptible to other people's negative opinions, the ideas, or unwanted advice about you and how you need to mm-hmm. live your life. Yeah. You know, and if I could be honest for a moment, this is the number one reason some of us put on a facade, you know, That's right. because we yeah. want to avoid the spotlight, right? So a tip is to, a tip to help you build your confidence and to courageously walk in your truth is just simply to embrace your difference. Because when you accept who you are, flaws and all, no one, no one can use your imperfection as, you know, ammunition to kill your self-esteem, to kill your faith, or even cause you to have self-doubt. Yeah, right on. Love yourself. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, I hear that loud and clear, and I love that. You know, a couple of things that really jump out to me from what you just shared there, Lakeisha, is first Uh of all, you know, giving yourself the room to to put yourself first, which, boy, can that be hard for survivors of sexual abuse to go, you know what, my needs, my desires – are it's okay to have those be primary and to let the expectations of other people drop away for a little bit so I can really Mm -hmm. tune in to what it is that I want and want to create for my life. And, yeah, yeah, that piece of just finding that way out of, you know, meeting the expectations, pleasing others, and giving yourself all sorts of permission, you know, to, to lean in to what you're feeling called towards and building that confidence. So, yeah, exactly that whenever you hit challenges, because, boy, we will. You know, anytime yeah, we pursue absolutely. a passion, there's going to be somebody saying, what? <laughs> you're going to do what? <laughs> right. That's not going to work. You know, all of that. So, man, to be yeah. able to have a mute button for those people is super important. <laughs> My it's goodness. super important. Yeah. It's super important. Yeah. And that just stems from, you know, people projecting their fears onto you. Yeah. And we had to learn how to just block it, you know, become a ninja warrior and just block it out. Yeah. Block it out. Block it yeah. out. And then keep moving forward. You know, yeah. because if, if you continue listening to everybody else, you know, you'll stay constant. You'll stay stagnant. 
You'll stay yeah. exactly where you are. So sometimes you just, you know, need to act in silence. I've done that a lot over the years where I just moved in silence. I didn't tell anybody. People just woke up one day, and I was an author. There it was. <laughs> you have a book. There it is. There it is. That's great. <laughs> <Right>? Yeah. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Okay, so, you know, a question that's coming to mind for me in this conversation around purpose and living your truth and stepping into, like, what you're most passionate and desiring of. You know, something that I I know that um, survivors run into is because of abuse and trauma, life can get a little derailed sometimes. Uh, Mm -hmm. You know, we're in that, we're in the hurt, we're in the pain, and so we're not pursuing our degree or we're not finishing that program that we set out to do. And then we find ourselves at this place of going, okay, well, it feels like those doors are now closed. The thing that I really wanted to do, the thing that I was passionate about and I cared about, it doesn't feel like it's even possible anymore. Time has passed. I'm too old. Da, 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 da. Um, I'd love to hear from your perspective, you know, wh- you know, how you kind of take that sort of thing on. When it feels like one dream or one purpose, the door has closed, closed on, uh, how do you approach that? What would be your advice or your guidance for folks who are feeling that way? Mm. Mm, that's a really, that's a really good question. You know, I ran into this really early on, um, when I was 17, 18 years old, I had to make a decision. And the reason why I had to make a decision is because my sister at the time was just murdered. And my brother was going down the same path. He was into, oh, you know, gangs, you know, doing drugs, and, you know, we're in the projects, and we had all, this thing, all these things going on. You know, our father wasn't in the household. You know, mm-hmm. my stepfather, you know, he was, you know, a drug addict, you know, and a pedophile. Mm-hmm. So that's the father favor I had growing up. So, you know, once he was out of the house and he was in, in prison, you know, my sister was murdered. I had to do something. I hadn't, I felt this, though. I had to do something. Mm-hmm. I had to be the person that my younger siblings needed to look up to. Like, I had to figure mm-hmm. out how to become the example of success that they needed to see, right, in order for them to know that there is something more for us out here. I didn't have a choice. And most times when when we're at that point, we probably don't have a choice. So I literally had to just not even think about it. And mm-hmm. just leap forward, and mm-hmm. I, you know, I really use my my sisters and my brothers. I put myself to the side, you know, because like I said, this was before the healing process. Like I was fresh out of right. while all this was going on. I was fresh out of the sexual abuse situation. Like my stepfather had just, you know, went to with the prison. I had to go through all that um, court hearings and all that, and you know, I had a decision to make. Um, luckily, I was accepted into a college. So I had college on one end, and then I had to dump on my sister on the other end. So it was like, what you going to do, Keisha? What you going to do? Mm-hmm. And I had to dig deep and really just, like, think about the people that will look up to me and be able to pull that motivation and inspiration wow. from me yeah. in order to do and be them. So in the be- So in the beginning, you know, I looked to my sisters and brothers like they were my motivating factor because at that point I had no mm-hmm. other motivation. Yeah, you know? my yeah. mom never went to my mom never graduated from high school. I was the first in my family to to go to college and to graduate from college. You know, I'm the first to do everything. So at that pivotal moment, I had to rely on something. I had to pull the motivation mm-hmm. from somewhere. Okay. So I used my sisters and brothers as a way to motivate myself to, to do something different from what we already knew. And, yeah. Yeah. and then, honestly, you know, once I made that first leap, I'm not going to mm-hmm. say that it became 100% easier, but, you know, it became a little bit easier to keep making leaps because yeah. every time you leap, you're moving forward. If you're not taking a step, you're standing in that exact same spot. Right. But every time I leap, I leap. I moved forward. I got somewhere. So I leaped again, and I leaped yeah. again, and I leaped again. And every time I came to a crossroads or a decision, you know, a really hard decision, I reflected back 
on the previous times where I would, when I was able to leap and move forward, mm-hmm. and that gave me the courage to leap again. Beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing more of your story with us. And, yeah. you know, when when we're in that space of loss and adversity, and I hear you talking about defining moments, right, choices, we have an opportunity mm-hmm. to choose whether we're going to stand still, become resigned, become mm-hmm. bitter, or uh-huh. and go, you know, maybe down a, the usual path or a possible path or a path we've seen, you know, having been taken by others, and or turn in a different direction and it's it's mm-hmm. a tough choice you know to make but i love that in those moments there was this little part of you that just said you know what just go for it just try just just try and just see try. i mean just my try. goodness mm-hmm. you know we don't know unless we leap and you know mm-hmm. i love that because when we start to feel that moment of like well you know my chance has passed or there's anything i can do now i guess i've just got to you know deal with this there actually still is that room to mm-hmm. to leap and create something new. And I loved what you said about those underlying motivators or factors for you. It was your family and your siblings. Mm-hmm. But for those mm-hmm. of you who are listening, like think about that question. Like what are the underlying motivators? Because sometimes, especially for survivors of trauma, it's hard to generate mm-hmm. self-motivation based on what we're mm-hmm. going to gain. Right, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but if we start to look out to what others are going to gain, yeah, then that can can propel us forward. Absolutely, yeah. So you've walked a really um, a beautiful path, a hard, challenging path, but but beautiful. A one of overcoming, a one of saying, you know what, hell no, I'm not going to just sit here. I'm not going to let life, you know, um, be the author. I'm going to step in and I'm going to, you know, put my hands on the reins and create something that, you know, I really care about. And I'm sure in that journey there have been some moments (laughs) that stand out to you as like make or break moments or just big moments of like learning um, and, you know, anything anything coming to mind, like any moments that really stand out to you that you want to, you know, share with our, our listeners today? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there was, there's a few defining moments, and it's actually my defining moments that helped me to identify and put a name to the, to the three different phases I talked about earlier. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the first defining moment was when I decided – not to return to law school because becoming an attorney was something I always wanted to do from the time I was a little girl, you know, and those who knew me growing up <clears throat> knew that I was just going to be an attorney. I was that little girl, right? Yeah. So that was the plan, Rachel. That was the plan to, to be an attorney. There was no plan B. There was no plan C. You know, once I got out of the situation I was in, I was going to become an attorney. Right. But once I got to law school and started my first year, I felt like that goal was was achieved and now I can like take it off my list. So that spark and drive and fire that I had for all those years of becoming uh, an attorney slowly deteriorated. So now what do I do? Right. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. I lost that fire to the point where I decided not to go back after my first year. And this was the hardest decision I made in my life, one of the hardest decisions. And I say that because it caused so much confusion. Because like I said earlier, there was no plan B. Right. All I ever thought about was being an attorney. And I couldn't understand for the life of me why I lost the drive to do it. But through some deep soul searching, I really had to dig deep to discover that answer. And the answer was the only reason why I was pursuing a career as an attorney was because my mom loved the TV show Perry Mason. <laughs> I just aged myself. Oh, but... Perry Mason. Oh, Lord. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> my mom loved the show Perry Mason. Uh-oh, right, so, yeah. So, <laughs> so because she absolutely loved Perry Mason and um, – you know, I decided to, to be an attorney just like Perry Mason because when I went deeper into my soul searching, you know, uh, becoming an attorney, you know, I realized that it stems from the sexual abuse because mm-hmm. at the time when I decided to be an attorney, I was searching, you know, and trying to connect, find a connection with my mom because at the time in my mind, we wasn't connected. Right. So I figured if I could just connect with my mom, have her love me just enough, 
she would do something to stop the sexual abuse. And wow. Perry Mason became my way to connect with my mom in order to get her to get her to love me enough to stop the sexual abuse. So yeah. this goal, this dream, you know, I had of becoming a lawyer was a dream, a goal that definitely helped me through my hardships, and I'm very clear on that point, but it was a goal that was only met for a season. Yeah. So I literally got to a point where I wanted to do something purposeful. I was ready to accept the calling that I had placed in my life, but first I had to figure that out. So the next to find a moment, because after deciding I had to go to law school and figuring all this out, you know, I started to reflect over my life to see what was constant. Mm-hmm. What's the constant thing that I love to do that people are always come to me for? And over the years, I found myself sharing my story to inspire and encourage other women, you know. And I wasn't only sharing about the sexual abuse, you know, but I talked about the other adversities that I overcame, you know, that I just shared with you earlier. Yeah. You know, and then I became that, listening ear that people turned to when they needed to talk. You know, then I became that person, you know, people would call when they needed an accountability partner. And then I became that person people would call to, you know, to brainstorm ideas or to put together a presentation so they can ask their boss for a raise at work. You know, I became that person people would call if, you know, they needed someone to, like, speak to a daughter or someone in their family just to give them some encouragement. You know, I became that person. People modeled. And I didn't know it, you know, I didn't know it, but I became the person that people modeled when they wanted to just change their circumstances. Mm. All because of my backstory. Because they saw where I was, they saw me overcome, and they saw where I am today. So I became their model. Nice. Yeah. So all of this was going on as I was torturing myself in law school. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> because let me tell you something. Law school is all about the gray areas, and I don't like right. it anyway. <laughs> like, right. You know, stay to the point. Just tell me exactly what's going on. And the law school is all about the gray areas. So I was literally chasing a, chasing a dream that didn't belong to me anymore. Mm -hmm. So with all this discovery, it was time to figure out how to make sense of it all, right, Mm -hmm. and how to live in my purpose, how to have a purpose-driven life that I was destined to have. It was time to fully walk in my truth and present this new me to the world and be okay with it. You know, because deciding not to go back to law school, like, I feel like I let some people down. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, it's sure. It's so funny how how other people get so, you know, got invested, so invested in me. Yeah, yes. invested in me becoming yeah. okay. And it's, and it's so funny, Rachel, because I can still get phone calls right now today, you know, people asking me for legal help. And it's been over 10 years since I attended law school. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I'm still getting <laughs> Random phone calls. <laughs> like, hello, can we update? Right. Update needed. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> so, so as a sister coach and owner and founder of, you know, a sister's truth, you know, I'm finally fulfilling my calling. You know, there has been yeah. some bumpy roads, some wins, some losses, and I'm sure there's a whole lot more to come. But this time, I'm excited about the challenges, nice. you know, as well as, as the successes that will come. Yeah. So, most yeah, it's that beautiful is, thing when you yeah. get that alignment. Yeah, sorry yes. to interrupt, Keisha, but I'm just like bursting with that right now because what I'm so hearing and what you're talking about is alignment, right? Yes. And when we pursue yes. goals that are out of alignment with our actual desires <laughs> but are based on, you know, other motivators or, um, you know, that are not um, – that are not going to propel us really, you know, towards something positive. Mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. yeah, we can get ourselves in, you know, in kind of a twist and all of a sudden end up doing things, you know, or doing jobs that, like, yeah, we might be good at them or might, it might be possible, but there's that lack of, like, exactly what you said, excitement mm-hmm. and yeah. willingness to, like, even go through the the things that might be difficult. You know, when you're aligned with your purpose, the challenges, you're like, okay, bring it mm-hmm. on. 
when you're outside mm -hmm. of your purpose, any challenge just feels like that much more of a kind of a slap in the face. Like this is, man, I don't like this and I got to deal with problems, <laughs> you know? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Being, aligned, being alignment with your purpose, you know, makes going through the challenges just a little bit more bearable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for just sure. A bit. Yeah. The other thing that just really jumps out to me from your story, which I think is so important for those of you who are listening, is like sometimes you can think you've got it. Like, okay, this is it. This is the thing. But, you know, life can have a different plan. And mm. if we can continue to stay tuned in, and that's okay. Mm. And, you know, to, to trust sometimes that, that, you know, it might yeah. be a wiggly path. Or you might think it was going to look one way, and then that door mm. closes. But you get to create a new path right yes. and a new opportunity yes. uh and that we find you know i can really relate to your story on a lot of levels <laughs> you know i was going to be a high school english teacher well oh, goodness okay. you know and uh, got to college and started working with high schoolers and was like i don't like these people at all <laughs> <laughs> and then it's exactly that feeling right. you were talking about like it's almost like the floor mm -hmm. drops out because you're like well yeah shit, what am i going to do now and yep. uh, but if we can stay, if we can stay, I think you know. If I were to draw some themes from what I'm hearing, it's like stay positive, stay optimistic, stay connected yes. to the possibility that there is something next. You know yes. that that leap does take you to a new place, and then the next leap. Because if we fall into that feeling of like, man, just again, I think resignation. It really is these two counter experiences of either becoming resigned and bitter. Or remaining open mm -hmm. and optimistic, um, and leaning into new possibilities. Absolutely, and you know, two more points I want to add to that is, is that also move with expectancy too. Mm -hmm. You know, because a lot of times when we're facing decisions, we're so afraid of failing, but yeah. have expectancy. You know that if you do something different, something different will happen. Right. Is it positive or negative? The point is. Did you all hear that? Let's say that happens. again, Lakeisha. <laughs> I think that bears repeating. <laughs> yes. That's a quote That's right no, there. Yes. If you do something, so something different, happens. something different is going to yes. happen. Yes. Something different is going to happen. So we really have to embrace change. Yes. Absolutely. We have to embrace change. And thankfully, I did that. You know, I was able to embrace change because yeah. like you said the floor you know fell from up under me when I was in when I was in law school you know when I was in law school it was like everybody was feeding for themselves and I yeah. wasn't like that I'm like you know let's all gather together you know and help each other out type of person that's not the case when you in law school you know right. it's very competitive so I had to embrace change in order to fully walk into my purpose you know I I don't know if you know Lisa Nichols. She's a motivational speaker. I love Lisa Nichols. And I heard her say that it's okay to be, and I'm probably going to butcher this, but she said, she says that it's okay to be committed to the vision, but don't be committed to how you get there. Yeah, for sure. It's okay, it's okay to be committed to the vision, but don't be so bent you know, bent on how you get there. Because right. like you said, it might not look the way you change. expect. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. That's powerful. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, you have just filled me with so much to take away and to ponder and just lifted my spirits in so many ways. And oh, thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> man, it's just such a joy. It's such a joy to have you here. And, you know, to hear a story of adversity and challenge and heartache and just mm -hmm. loss and pain, but to see you just, you know, thriving in your life and not mm -hmm. letting those experiences define you and taking mm -hmm. all that you have learned through those challenges and, you know, sharing that with the, the beautiful people who come into your world and um, have the joy of working with you. I just, you know, I champion you and cheer you thank on you so because much. it's so beautiful. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank Man, you, thank you. Any, any final, final thought for folks listening today? <laughs> um, yes, absolutely. I just want to tell everybody who's listening today that no matter what it is that you're, that you're going through or what you overcame, you know, there's a purpose in calling on your life. Like there is somebody 
who need your gift and your talent. You know, so it's important for you to be exactly who you are so you can be a blessing to someone else because you never know who's watching you. You never know who's pulling encouragement from you. So it's important for you to be you so we can teach the younger generation that's coming behind us how to be authentic to themselves. So if I, if, you know, everything we said and talked about today just completely goes over your head or goes in one ear and out the other, hopefully that's not the case, I just want each and every one of your listeners to remember and never forget, and that's they are enough and their truth yeah. is beautiful. Yeah, I second that. Absolutely. Yeah. So for those of you who are listening today, I just hope you have been encouraged and inspired. And if you would like to connect with Lakeisha, you can certainly um, email her at info at assisterstruth.com. And you can also learn more about her sister coaching programs uh, at asisterstruth.com. So do not hesitate to reach out and connect with her, particularly if you're finding yourself at a place in your healing journey where you've done a lot of that kind of clearing out all the clutter and confusion and you're really in that place of now it's time to step into what's next and what's new, uh, I know she can help you get there. And also a great way to um, continue learning from Lakeisha is to pick up her newly published book. You know that book she was, uh, you know, writing on the down low? (laughs) Well, (laughs) it is not on the down low anymore. It is published. No, it's not. (laughs) That's right. So 31 Days of Truth. Manifest Your Passion, Power, and Perseverance is now available on Amazon. So please head over there and get your copy today. I know I've I've already had a little preview of it, and it's a really, really beautiful book and guide and takes you through exercises so you can really dig in and um, and discover some really wonderful things. And uh, I want to just take a moment to thank all of you for joining us today and remind you to visit rachelgrantcoaching.com to learn more about sexual abuse recovery coaching and explore the other resources available. And please do be sure to subscribe to this podcast. And if you've been touched, inspired, or helped, please leave a little message for us and review. We'd love to see that. And continue to come back each month because we have so much more to share with you. And until then, take good care.